The 12 Ways to Rock Retail. And then those of you who know me, I'm Bob Fibbs, the Retail Doc. You probably have been on my newsletter list or you followed me or saw me speak somewhere in your life or read one of my four books. I got a lot of people that take a lot of interest in what I have to say, but I'm excited by my special guest, Burl Workman, who is uh, the, a motivational speaker like me, part of the National Speakers Association, writer, trainer. He's a master coach. As a matter of fact, he has helped me create my coaching program that uh, I'll get a chance to tell you about all the way at the end. And I love his quote, every company has a culture that's either intentionally created or it's accidentally created. I love that, Burl. That's the best. That's the best. It's true. We get to choose. I, I don't think most of us think we had a choice. So our roadmap for today is we're gonna go. We're gonna go over those twelve ways to rock retail. Of course, we're gonna give you the results pyramid, let you understand how a lot of the things that we bring to the table sometimes don't serve us, and what has to change, and then creating those new experiences. And then at the end, I will give you an opportunity to join my uh, master coaching series, and we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. So that's where we're going today. Here are the 12 ways to rock retail. Um, you know, one of the things I like about Verl is he actually has been a retailer and has been through all the same things that you have. There they all are. You can either accept all of them or you could, uh, you know, tell me in chat which one is the one that you you find interesting. But I'm going to keep on moving a little bit. Let's talk about those, uh, Verl. So, you know, well, what what? ask me some questions, you know. Yeah, so let's just I just want to kind of get into this and say thank you for having me as a guest and being part of this. And you know, Bob talks about all of his friends and the people that have been engaged with them over the years and it's an honor to be part of this group. So thank you for thank you for having me. Uh, my company is out of Salt Lake City, Utah, where we have uh, about 35 employees and we have about 100 coaches that uh, uh, focus on high performance. And when Bob and I were sitting in a mastermind group having a conversation about high performance, he, he says, "I know there's another level." And how do I take all this knowledge and information and the stuff that I have in my brain and take people who want to engage at a higher level and help them with that? And so that's why I'm here. And so I, I want you to know that I appreciate it. And I'm, uh, I'm honored to be part of this. I, I got to tell you, what's what, do you, what like? So I'm in the real estate space. Almost all of my clients are in the real estate space. And we have massive cha challenges going on in real estate today. We have, you know, you have high inflation and high interest rates. You've got the wars that are going on, you've got this geriatric presidential election and everyone's trying to decide which is the worst of two evils. Um, and uh, we got the Gen Zs that are going out there and writing in their own votes. Like there's all this un unstableness or, un in, you know, and uncertainty in the marketplace. What? How is that affecting retail? What is uncertainty doing to your clients? Everything is roses. Everything's going really well. No, of course not. That's the trouble, right? We just came out of the pandemic and suddenly you were thinking no one's going to be around Everyone wanted, if you had it in stock, you were amazing. You could hire anyone and they're like, we have it in stock. And they were amazing. And now we clawed a lot of that demand from 2024 and 2025 backward into those. So everybody's looking around and saying, what's going on? And everybody's kind of pulled back and waiting. The things that used to work don't seem to be working as well. And that's true for retail. And that's true for anybody, but particularly where you've got people having to talk to people in a physical space, right? You've hired people, they've quit, they don't show up the next day. I hear it. I hear that pain. And that's really why we're on this call today, right? Yeah. So I'm curious, if you don't mind as guests, I'd love to have you go in. And if you could like identify what your most urgent business problem is, or what the biggest challenge you're facing is right now, go in the chat and write it down for us. And let's make sure that we spend a little extra time on the things that are like, like the thorn in your shoe, the thing that keeps you up at night, though, like if you could solve this, Joy, this would, that'd be a, like a big game changer. And Cynthia, you know, in dealing with children's and the things you're doing in retail, boy, what would be the biggest thing that would make the biggest impact? Joy's, um, that's, that's, all of you are great. Joy, committed to long-term core staff leadership. Kelly's follow-through. Cynthia, managing my team to meet their goals. And uh, Jennifer, unpredictability in demand. Hmm, yeah, I mean, I think that's, and the challenge is with all of those things, we start looking for, I don't know, is it fair to say excuses, Verl? I mean, it's like, oh, it must be Amazon. It must be somebody else. And all you can think about is what what ship can you drive, right? What can you do in your four walls? Yeah, it's interesting. You can't change so, the rest. Of it. Yeah, well, a lot of these, you know, I love all these issues, by the way, challenges and purchasing methods online versus in, you know, in person, drive through, sit down, I'm pretty good. But like all of those things cause um, fear. And when I think about emotional intelligence, I think about what fear does to people. And fear causes people to pull back and just wait and see. 
And they, it happens to leaders, it happens to employees, and it happens to consumers. When there's fear or uncertainty, the natural reaction is to pull back and pause. And so how do we take, how do we take and change the way we message to our market so that it takes people from fear and that negative emotion and moves into a positive emotion like hopeful or optimistic? And that's, you know, that's what we, I think we should talk about. Like, what do you have to know and what do you have to control to be able to move forward when there's fear and uncertainty in the marketplace like this? I think you have to know what your true north is. I think ultimately it's going to come down to you because there's always a choice, right? There's always a choice. Either I use the choice muscle, I say, holy crap, I'm getting on, I'm getting on my little Facebook group and I'll say how awful it is to be you. And everyone's like, oh, yes, it is awful to be you. And then when talk in that, right? Or not everybody's hurting, Burl. That's the thing. High performers are are coming back to me and saying, now's the time I'm opening another store. What am I going to need to feel, to do, to think about before I get back into it? Because ultimately, yeah, the, the workforce has changed. They're not going to put up with you saying on autopilot, yeah, go shadow him for a month, right? And customers are knowing too. I was reading a, a uh, study the other day that said the average person will walk out of store and not buy anything within two minutes. It's like, wow. I mean, we say to hire people and make sure they greet them within 15, two minutes doesn't sound like a long time. But if you're waiting, watching somebody else, or you're watching, I was in Santa Fe uh, last week, and I walked in the store, and these two people behind the counter had this nice little conversation. And I walked out without anything. Oh, by the way, they had on their couches, do not sit, do not sit, do not stand anywhere. I was like, really? And they're selling like $16,000 lighting fixtures. And all I thought was, you don't get it. Like there's less people walking in the door. I could have been your one guy that day. And that passion has to be somewhere on your sales floor because I think we've taken the customer for granted and you can get away with it. And let's face it, you dodged a bullet, right? Verl, if, you, if you're here after the pandemic, hey, kudos to you, you figured something out. You know, we've um, when the pandemic hit, one of the things we did at Workman is we changed our whole philosophy on how we dealt with customers. And we're a sales organization. I mean, we sell. I, I used to say that I'm, I'm a freaking sales animal. I wake up every morning and I eat rejection for breakfast. And uh, the consumer today has let us know clearly that they don't want to be sold anymore. And we changed our motto as a company from, ser- from, you know, from serve before opportunity to serve regardless of opportunity. And when you think about that, that means that we're going to do the right thing and we're going to create these amazing client experiences regardless of whether or not they do business with us. We're going to leave them better off today than they found us. And uh, during a time when everybody was dying, we were we were growing. We have clients like in Raleigh, North Carolina. It was kind of interesting, Bob, that the market's down 40%, but they're up they're up 10%. That's a 50% differentiator. And so they're not allowing the market to control their success. So what are the things that we can control? What are the things that we should know in our own business so that we can coach these people or help them when the market is changing, but others are having success? Like, what, you, you, I, I'm going to ask you a quick story because you have a great story when you were selling hot tubs and you're at the fair. Tell me about that story. To me, that illustrates everything about the right, right way to focus. Well, so, you know, for me, it was for me, you know, we, we have this kind of a whole experiences thing and we set our goals based on what we believe is true. And just because we've had experiences in life that makes us believe something's true doesn't mean it's actually true. So I remember going, I remember going to my first time I, I used to sell hot tubs and satellite dishes. I was that guy at the fair. And I remember my very first uh, state fair, I set a goal to sell 10 hot tubs. And I thought, man, if I just sold 10, that would be amazing. And I remember at the very last day, I sold my 10th hot tub and there's an RV guy on here. So he knows exactly what I'm talking about, selling RVs at the fair. And um, the very last day I hit my goal, I gave it away. I didn't make any money on it, but I didn't care. I hit my goal. I, I went to the frozen lemonade stand and I'm standing there getting my frozen lemonade. And I turned around and the guy with the logo on his shirt that said Cal Spas was sitting behind me. And I turned around and said, hey, how you guys doing over there at Cal Spa?" He goes, oh, we're killing it, son. How you doing? And talking to me like I was a little kid. And I'm like, well, I got my goal. <laughs> he says, what was your goal? I said, I don't want to say, but let's just say 10. He goes, oh, that's cute. I'm like, well, how many did you guys sell? He says, we sold 100. Like two people selling a similar product at the same fair. What is it about one that sold 10 and one that sold 100? And the answer was that the one that sold 100 had a system and a process that they followed, and they had a belief that it was possible, and so they behaved according to that belief. Does that make sense? And so we set goals, and we, we, we 
we run our businesses based on the experiences we have that form these beliefs. I immediately changed my belief. I went and looked at everything they did, created a system around it. Next year, sold 70 hot tubs at the same fair. I found someone doing better than me, and I copied them. By the way, that is totally my secret to success in everything that I do. It's just find someone doing it better than you and just say, what's your system? I believe that anything you do three times, you must have a system for it and that we track and measure everything. Bob, when you're talking about knowing your numbers from an operational perspective, what are the things that you think are critical that we track? So the number of items per sale is like my true north because it's the one thing your crew most can effect, right? And even if you're, let's say you've got a number of items for sale, your candy store, you sell five, I don't know, whatever it is, whatever that is, that's a real number. You can actually mark that and say, that's it. Uh, how about the average sales per hour from each employee, right? So you, it's a little more sophisticated. Some of you have to do it by hand, but how many hours did they work? What did they sell? How much profit are they doing? And the, the reason a lot of people don't want to look at that, Verl, is because frankly, we've made most of our employees into taskmasters, like go move that stuff. Oh, fill the order over here. And customers are secondary. So when you don't look at that, how much average sales per employee, suddenly that's out of sight, out of mind, right? And then accountability. A lot of people here talk about accountability. How do I make them do something? How do I make them uh, you know, follow our process? And frankly, it's not so much the accountability that's the problem, it's the awareness, right? Because if you're not aware of it, if you're not actually paying attention and saying, okay, this is what's happening, this is what needs to change, then I think suddenly you're you're looking around for answers out over there. Oh, it's a new Instagram thing. It's a new this. But oh my gosh. Okay, you're dealing with like 15 things so fast I can't even write them all down that fast. So so you said average cost or average sale per employee. That's like a critical metric that we track. So we number know of per items per sale. Okay. The number of items per sale. So what, what you're saying is just by bringing something to the counter doesn't mean that should be the only thing they buy. If this, then what's the suggestive things that go along with that to increase the average number of items per sale? But that's not just going to happen. That's, I think, part of the challenge we think is we'll just tell people, girl, you need to add on to that. Like, what but, does that look like? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to do that? And so I'm looking at Joy and Cynthia, and thank you for turning your videos on, you two, and uh, being being part of the interaction. So um, here's what I believe. I believe that accountability for most people is um, a false, a falsehood. Like I, I'm looking at I'm looking at Joy right here, and I I I believe for sure, Joy. You tell me if I'm wrong that I can't make you do anything you don't want to do. Is that true? If you don't want to do it, right? Probably. Right. I mean, if I don't want to do it, right? So so me saying I'm going to hold you accountable is a bunch of crap. But I what I can do is if we track the right things, and you're if you become aware that the activities that you're focused on aren't giving you your results, you choose to make a course correction. So accountability is a choice you make based on information. It's not something someone does to someone. So accountability is a choice you make. It's not like beating you over the head or grounding you or taking away your cell phone. Accountability, in my opinion, is love. It's like it's I care about you enough to give you feedback, and I believe you wake up every day and want to be successful. Does that does that make sense, Cynthia? Like you get up every you don't get up every day and hope you fail. You get up every day and you want to win. But when you don't track the right things, you don't measure the things that make the biggest impact, then you don't know how to make the course correction. So accountability happens when you become aware. And so when Bob talks about tracking, and I think it's really important, he does it like, okay, number of sales, you, you roll it off the top of your head. To me, it's having a system to be able to track the things that matter the most, and then having somebody in your life that cares about you enough to review those numbers. Bob, do you just average it out because, you know, we're not commission based and the person ringing isn't the person who necessarily made the sale. And so I've always I've thought about sales per hour per employee, but I can't really tie it specifically to the employee. Well, even if you don't necessarily do it that way, you still know how many hours they worked. In right. A, how much did they contribute in a month to your sales? That's where I look at it. And because even if it's you and Cynthia and Burl and Jane and whoever, on average, as you track that every day, suddenly you're going to see that, oh, our average per sale is really low. What is that per hour worked? And then you're going to make different choices about, well, where should I be uh, putting those people? What, what are the jobs I'm having them do? Because a lot of times we let people hide. And one of the 12 things is making sure that you're not holding on to people that you and I both know. I bet I could ask each one of you on this call, 
give me the first name of the person that needs to go to your organization and you've answered it already. You don't what have to write it down. What if, what if they're your family? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I've had we've had that, right? Because right. because here's the thing, the market will tell you when you're getting ready to close, oh, you know what you should have done? And by then you have crystal clear vision. Oh, I see what I didn't do. I didn't pay myself. I didn't pay attention. I actually didn't clear my entire store all the way through top to bottom. So a person who doesn't notice who's new to my store thought we looked dated and uh, didn't care about it. It's all of those little things in hindsight we see, which is why people bring me in and they're like, here, what do you think I should do? Well, as some of you know, bring me into your store and uh, I'll look at your counter and I'm like, well, this is all wrong. And they're like, why? You have a hundred things at the counter. I know it's great. Isn't this like, what are you, a convenience store? You have to think about the science. Someone came in, they bought whatever they wanted. You have one last shot at them, whatever that thing is. And everybody better love it. Not, you know, love poems to my poodle uh, from the thought of a, a person living in the Northeast. Like I have to think about it. that's a considered purchase. Maybe some people would like it, but no, that would be terrible which is why you see people put, you know, phone extensions and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, one thing I wanted to un unpack real quick, I think I actually even have a slide if I can go back to sharing my screen here is um, one of the things people keep talking to me, asking me about is um, how do I, these are some of the things that, you know, everybody talks about long IRLs, work-life balance, it's stressful, all that. But the one I hear a lot is how do I hire better? Ultimately, how do I hire better? Here's the key. They're not coming through the door. The right, good ones right, are right. already working. You're going to have to poach them. That means you're going to have to go out, spend an hour every week, say, I'm going to go to the convenience store, the dry cleaner. I don't care where. If I've got a light that I see in somebody's eyes, I'm going to say, would you like some more hours? Come see me. Be ready, though. You're going to have to pitch them on why you're better than working where they're at. You've got a plan for success. You're going to be able to train them. Maybe if you find out their side hustle, you're going to be able to add to their life. You're going to have to uh, find out the personality. Now, you could take a picture of this or any of the slides, actually. You can scan that. That's my free personality quiz. If you're in sales or actually you already have one. But this is designed when you've already said yes. This is not a pre-employment thing. But I want to find out, how does this person process information? And then once I know that, I'm going to probe in the onboarding and certainly in my questioning to find out, are they trainable? So tell me a time when you were trained in your last position, how it felt. Oh, it sucked. Oh, why is that? Oh, it was unorganized or this or this or, oh, how do you feel about training? Oh, I'm okay. Great. Tell me a time someone trained you on something, whether it's in business or sports or something, and what the effect was. You want to make sure they understand this is who we are. And then you're going to prioritize training because the days of hired them and shadow someone never really work great, but they really work terribly because the person is going to pull out their phone and they're going to hide. And then you're going to this weird game of, you know, did you help that person? And they're going to say, yes, and all of that other stuff. And so here's the big idea of this. I'm going to ask Burl to, to help me on, with this. Go ahead. Before you move on, before you move on from that, can you go off, stop sharing for just a minute? Let's just, can we, I'd like to spend a minute on this because I think that the hiring process, you know, it's funny, Joy put in here that I've got all these issues with this, generation this covid generation they want to work from home they want to get paid and then they'll show you if they'll do the work we've got people saying that um yeah like it's so funny like my son my son's working up at park city ski resort and he he got tired of going up there every day they're paying him 22 dollars an hour to stand at the lift and check your pass and then he says yeah so i put in my two-week notice I'm like, do you have another job? He says, well, no, but I'll get another one. Like he is the generation you're talking about. And I'm like, dude, like he's grown up in an entrepreneurial household. Like we're all, you know, we all, we all think about uh, work so differently. And I'm watching this next generation and like, and they live in my own house and it's confusing to me. Um, but, you know what I'm saying? Like he'll spend, he'll spend every paycheck on gaming stuff to make everything go faster so he can play more games. He works to, to feed his habit. And we've created, an, we've created an environment. And then I've got a 17-year-old who's part of the anxiety generation. And so, you know, when COVID hit and they all went home from school, they stopped learning how to be social and all their interactions happened in social media. 
Um, and then I look at the kids that are dating today and all this online dating. And I want to think about online dating. You started talking about attraction. You talked, you talked about recruiting. And you can't just sit in your store and hope people come in and answer the help wanted sign that you put next to your open because nobody's coming in. And so attraction and recruiting is a contact sport. It's what are the activities that you're focused on to, to drive people in so you have more choices. We can't just do wish marketing or put ads up on Indeed and hope they all come in. I, and I was thinking about, I'm thinking about all the different people here with all the different types of businesses from RVs to children's, to, to children's toy, toys and books. to uh, So everybody has different kinds of businesses. But my question is this, if, if, if your store was involved in online dating, and people looked at what they saw online, are you attractive? Would they swipe right or swipe left? How are you separating and setting yourself apart from everybody else? So as an employer, as an in place to work, people are like, swipe right, I wanna know more. What's the culture that's intentionally being created that is almost viral? Because your people love coming to work every day because you've created this environment where they're being developed. You, you know, when Bob talked about this personality assessment, when you hire people, the personality assessment isn't to do things, um, it's not to manipulate them, it's to create an environment that allows them to feel heard, that they respond to the way you communicate with them. It's the highest form of, it's the highest form of respect is to understand who someone is and then change your style to make them comfortable in the way you're communicating with them. And it's so cool to watch that dynamic. And so what, what the problem is, is we talk about it in these little sound bites. And so we're having these sound bites today where we're dropping these nuggets of things that we could do, but it's almost like I need a month. I want to work just on that one thing. I want you to give me the assignment, show me what to do. I want to go put it to work. I want to come back to you and say, hey, Bob, I did this. This is the result I got. What do I need to change to get a different result going forward? So I can create that culture where when these kids that are entering the workflows see my work, they swipe right because all their friends are working there and they love it. Like that's the, that's the energy of the type of place that I want to create for the people that work for me is – I want to be attractive. I want, I want to, I want people to look at me, oh, swipe right. And it's maybe, funny, you know, people always talk about Chick-fil-A, like, oh, well, that's Chick-fil-A. It's like, do you know that their whole idea is they got to develop their crew? That's it. It's all about that. It's not about marketing. It's not doing anything else. It's just, how do I do it? Let, I'm going to start a book club. I'm going to do this. We're going to talk about this video we saw. We're going to see how we do that. And they have, they have an energy. Would you agree? They have an energy around them. Whether you like the rest of the product or you eat that product has nothing to do with it. But I think that I, or, or um, in and out oh, that's in and out It's like, why do we see it in fast food, which to me is a much harder place to develop a crew than it is in a retail store. You're high volume, really pressure, something goes wrong on a $4 drink, they throw the burger in your face or whatever, right? A lot of things go wrong. But pivoting all of that says it's got to be different. And I think it comes from what we do uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, what we do when we go through and just look at what you believe about working in retail. Look about what what happens. And so Burl has explained this comes from a, a, a book, The Oz Principle. And it's basically the idea that you grow up, you have all these experiences. So good or bad, doesn't matter. From that, you get beliefs about work, about people, about opportunity, all sorts of things. You know, I, I have uh, come from my dad. Mom was a teacher and my dad was a preacher. And those both rat, rhyme. And... Um, their thing was, you work at a job for 40 years, whether you like it or not, hard work, just go in every day, shut the hell up, suck it up, do it. And so there was a limit, like, oh, I should be working for someone else. So when I said, oh, I think I'm going to go out on my own, my mom freaked out, like, why would you do that? That's the worst thing ever. And even within the first couple of years, actually probably in the first 20 years, she would, she would just say over uh, lunch, so how's that speaker thing going? Are you still doing that? Like, like this random thing because in her mind that didn't make any sense because here's the thing those experiences give us beliefs of good or bad right and from those beliefs we take action so now think about one of your employees they come in they not trained they walk up to somebody can I help you find something no i'm just looking oh okay does it four or five times what is the belief they get people only want to be helped when they ask nobody wants help it sucks working retail and when that belief is in place now their best friend is right there to say, you're right. And what results do they get? Who gives a crap? And so yeah, if, we don't fix, if we don't fix the experiences, 
and those beliefs, I think we get caught in the actions. Would you agree, Verl? Like we say, if I just did this, if I just told them that, but it doesn't really fix what's going on underneath, right? It's that feeling that we've got to find if we're going to get results. And I'm going to stop the share and bring back to you. Yeah, look, if, if, let's unpack that some more. I love the analogy as a teacher and a preacher. I think that's awesome. Well, yeah, so my mom told me I shouldn't go to college because, you know, I wasn't that smart. I was in resource as a kid and that, you know, because I wasn't very smart, I shouldn't go. And so my experience as a kid was I was told that I wasn't going to accomplish great things because I wasn't that smart. Now, I want you to think about what parent does that to a child, but mine did. And I love my mother and she did a lot of things great. She raised seven kids on her own. But like that, my experience as a child formed my belief in what was possible. And I set goals based on what those beliefs are. How many of you are trying to hire people that are from a different generation than you are? Like they're... Just put it in the chat real quick. Put yeah. a Y or an N. Put a Y or an N. Quick, quick, quick. You can do it. Why do we do that? Because the mind can go to sleep. We need you to keep th keep with us. Don't pick up that phone. Don't look so at that email. <laughs> so when you think about that, so they have different life experiences. They were in school during COVID and they, they, were, they had an experience that told them they didn't have to go to school anymore and they could still get good grades. They had experiences that changed their beliefs on the result they would get, even though um, we saw something very different. I learned that if I didn't go to class and I didn't do my homework, I didn't get good grades. My daughter was told recently by her counselor, well, you really don't need to go to that class. We have a packet you can do in a weekend that will give you the same, that you can get an A in that class. She's like, well, okay, I'll do that with all my classes. That's stupid. I'm going to do three-day packets and be done with high school. Well, like my experience says, no, you got to go to class because you learn how to learn, learn how to think, you interact and have social experiences. Well, we have this whole generation of young people that didn't get those experiences that we had. And so they have a different belief in what's possible. Does this make sense? And so based on what they believe, they come to work and they believe they're going to get a result without putting in the effort because they were trained that way during COVID. So now all of a sudden we have to change their belief. And the only way that I know how to change that belief is to create new experiences. And so we create new experiences and by doing so it changes what they believe is possible and the way, and the way you create new experiences. So like, I don't know what you believe in. If you believe in God or some bigger power, you know, you take your kids to church and you go on mission trips and you go serve at the soup kitchen because you want them to have experiences where they get a feeling of doing good and making a difference in other people's lives so that when they're not living in your house anymore, they contribute to society. So we create experiences for our kids hoping they form beliefs that govern how they behave. Well, think of your re your store, think of your business as an experience. And you have this unusual, really cool opportunity to change the beliefs and what people, people actually see as possible. They have all these outside influences that tell them they don't have to work, they don't have value, sorry, they don't have value, they've got high anxiety, they've got all these outside influences that are pounding on them, and now you have this opportunity to lead them. How do you want to lead them? Who do you want to be in this scenario? I want to be the, I want to be the guide or the mentor that helps them see things that, that, that I want to be the cow spa guy that says, you know, you could have done 100. If you just change the way you greet someone and you change the way you interact with them and you change a little bit about the way you ask questions about their wants, needs, and desires are when they come into the service department, you're going to find that they will do great things. We, we went to dinner the other night, Bob, with some friends of ours, and they picked us up in a Porsche. Sick. It was a sick Porsche four-seater. My wife and I sat in the back seat just because I wanted to see if there was room. And there was. And my wife says to the guy, Stan, this smells like a new car. And, and they both went, yeah, well, we took it into service because we needed new tires and they sold us a new Porsche. <laughs> she got the exact same color because you don't want everyone to know she bought a new Porsche when she got a flat tire. To me, that's creating an unbelievable service experience that's, that gets somebody into a whole new purchase. Like, what are we doing to create those experiences for our employees and our customers. We think about having great client experience. I want you to think about having great employee experiences because your employee, anyway, sorry, I don't mean to go off on this, but. Well, I think your passion is there and that's what we're talking about here, right? Is that it's being brilliant on the basics. That's the thing. When we say what doesn't work in retail, it's easy to come up with that. But when it comes to it, if you just say, well, what would it take for me? You know, you all heard that story about me. I got the highest, uh, I got the highest goal in the company when I was working in retail. 
And uh, I went to this new store and they hated my guts because I tried to put them into my process. And two employees were having sex in the back when I was getting to the bank. And one was flirting with the customers and all these terrible things. And I went up to the boss and I said, you need to lower my goal. And he's like, I said, oh, it's not possible. They burned my, my customer list. There's no way for this anniversary sale. No way it's going to happen. And he goes, and I guess you're not the guy I thought you were. I was like, what? And on the way home, I thought, but what if I could? And I think that's the difference. I think, you know, we're going to be talking about the coaching program a little bit. If someone isn't saying, what if we could, what are they saying to you right now? Which is we can't. And that's not a fun place to work. It's not a fun place to play. But that sense of doom and gloom, I think we're in a lot of retailers right now. And I think we're struggling because we've kind of forgotten, oh, I could change that with my thoughts and what I want to bring to the table. Uh, does that make sense, Verl? So true. What you said made me think of this is that is the thing that we focus on, the thing that we spend our energy focusing on becomes our truth. So if you focus on, I can't hire good people, guess what? If you focus on nobody wants to work, it becomes your truth. Well, and but so, then when you go to tell your other friends about it, then you find other people that same limiting belief, like you're right. It's terrible. Yeah. See? See, and now you share all those war stories. And what does that give you? It, it brings that whole thing back to belief that this is unconquerable. And that's what we're here to say is, look, this is not my first rodeo. I've been doing this a while. It's not Verl's first rodeo. We've gone through and done this. But I'm excited to talk about we are launching the 12-month coaching program. It's tailored to business owners. It's all about making your goals something that you can do to give you that inspiration but more importantly, it's not fluff. It's a matter of saying, look, we're going to pay attention. We've got this whole new AI uh, Bob brain that's part of it. Taking all my webinars, all my books, all my uh, podcasts, you name it. And that's baked into it. It's got accountability baked into it. But the key to all of it is thinking about um, how you can do it. It's not a matter of thinking someone else that's out of your realm Bro, you have a story, I think, about the uh, Sherpa story. Isn't that what uh, you were telling me before we got on? Yeah, so I'm trying to think about um, – there's, so there's so many pieces. You know, one of the things that every time I talk to Bob, I realize that he's got this unbelievable life experiences that I don't have. And these life experiences – and Cynthia's nodding her head – that yeah, he sees things from a different perspective. And when he, he's able to look at something that you're in and see it, I don't, I don't see it. But when I talk to him, I'm like, oh, well, I didn't, I didn't notice that. And I don't, I don't know how many. When you think about this, I, I remember. I just want. To, I'm going to give you a couple of examples or stories as you talk about, as you talk about coaching. Um, how many, how many high performers do you know in any sport, any business that don't have at least one coach, right? And you know, I was the, you know, we go to. So Bob and I are part of the National Speakers Association, and we're part of some pretty cool mastermind groups. And we get to hear all these great uh, speakers, and people have great life journeys. And some of my favorite speakers are the ones that do Mount Everest. Remember the blind guy that climbed Mount Everest blind? And his keynote was unbelievable. And I was just thinking about that. And so I, I went ahead and I went and Googled it. I want to go climb Mount Everest. And I started looking at everything. What equipment do I need? How many get ready hikes do I need? And everything kept coming back to this one group of people that live in Nepal. And that is anybody know who these people are? You go to Nepal and you sign up and you get a Sherpa. Have you ever heard that term before, a Sherpa? The Sherpa are the locals that they're like the sages. They climb Mount Everest several times every summer. They take the groups in and they make sure you have all the right equipment. That They tell you when the climate is right, when we should summit, when we have to stop, when we need oxygen, when to call the life helicopter in because there's no way, other way you're getting off this mountain because you're going to die. These Sherpas are your guides in the process. And it's really funny because when you talk to anybody who's ever climbed a Mount Everest, whether that's your retail stores, your Mount Everest, or your service department, or it's your uh, place of business, that's your Everest. That's this peak um, to have somebody who's gone up that mountain so many times this summer and knows exactly what you need to do to get to greatness and is able to take you step by step through. That's what a Sherpa is. And I think about coaching. Uh, when we talk, when I was talking to Bob about building a coaching program, I said, you know, you're like the, you're like the Sherpa of retail and, but people don't get access to your brain. And so they get access to your training 
but it's very different to have a live conversation with you where you take a concept and explain it and then you show it and then they can give you feedback and you can see, you know, if you, if you continue down this road, there's going to be a crevice. Does that make sense? And so, and, if, and, and so we're going to go a different way. There's more than one way to get to the top. And today, because on this climate, we're going to go around it. And that's what, that's what coaching is to me. Coaching is having a Sherpa. I, I, I was flying back from, um, Atlanta to Salt Lake City. I live in Salt Lake City. And there was a was sitting next to a lady and this lady had these big legs. And I'm like, oh, you must be a skier. And she said, yeah, I ski a little bit. And I'm like, well, what do you, what do you mean a little bit? She says, well, I'm on the U.S. Olympic ski team. And I said, oh, what's your name? She says, Pickaboo Street. I'm like, what the greatest like downhill skier of all time. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I said, it was so what an honor to meet you. I said, tell me about like, I just, we just got, you know, I'm, I'm the obnoxious guy that's sitting next to you on the plane that wants to ask all the questions. That's me. And I'm asking all these questions. And I say, can I ask you a question about coaching? I said, do you have a coach that's made an impact in your life? And she looked at me like that was the dumbest question anybody could ever ask her. She, what are you talking about? Do I have a coach? I have a coach for every condition. I have a downhill coach. I have a slalom coach. I have a coach for icy conditions, a coach for powder. I have an equipment coach, a mindset coach. And I have a physical fitness coach and I have uh, one that just works on my nutrition, like literally specialist in every area of her business in order for her to be a gold medal winning athlete. So who are you in this story and who do you want to be? And I think that sometimes we um, we worry about what it's going to cost us instead of looking at how much money we're leaving on the table because we don't know what questions to ask. Does that make sense? That's right like, when I'm in when I'm in it, I don't see it. But when you look at it, you see it because you're not. It's like a, it's like I, I, it's kind of like a hot air balloon. It's like like the ability to see the forest from an elevated position and see a clear path forward. That's that's to me what great coaching is all about. And I don't mean to go off on that, but I've got so many experiences personally and professionally where um, a coach has just given one little piece of advice that has changed my income by literally millions of dollars. Like, like a simple thing, like we always did one year contracts. And my coach says to me, well, have you ever thought about doing longer ones? Like, no, because nobody in my industry does that. He goes, yeah, I'm not from your industry. I was like, what? So I, I, I said, okay, well, I'm going to try and do two and three year contracts. Well, it changed the number of months a client stays with us from 12 to 22. And it doubled our revenue in 12 months. Like it was unbelievable to go from a million dollars to $3 million to $5 million. And what I learned is at every level of business, you have to break your systems and then you have to rebuild in order to be able to scale to the next level. How many of you feel like you're stuck? And you put a Y in the chat, put a Y in the chat. I, feel like you're I might need to break a few things so that I can kind of grow to the next level. That's kind of the that's the concept I'm thinking about. So what, and so, and you don't know what you don't know. And I remember that conversation so clearly because it was a piece of coaching advice that literally changed the trajectory of my business. In my Which is kind of the conversation years, you and I had when you said, Where, where's your coaching program? I was like, uh, I don't know. I've tried coaching. I've tried mentoring. He's like, no, no, no. Like you just need a system for this. And I was like, oh, he goes, cause you have all this knowledge. You only do it with your best clients, the people that pay you a lot for a business makeover or a speech, something like that. What about the people that know and love you? I was like, um, so we spent almost six months putting this together. It's really an exciting program. And I wanted to show you about it real quick. Uh, and then I'll take any questions you might have about it. Uh, so the it's a year long process where you get what you want. So if you're looking to increase your profitability, reduce your churn, get greater reviews, more repeat and referral business, right? That's part of the challenge. You have three legs in a retail store. I'm either going to get more people in or I'm going to get them to buy more stuff from me or they're going to come back a little bit more. That's your three that you can work on, but you got to work on all three of them if you're looking to grow your business and then get your life back. So you wake up every day and love what you do instead of, oh, crap, I got to work with Jane today or got to work with Mark today and ultimately get that prescription for how to do retail and 2024 and be with a different set of of people who are figuring it out i don't think anyone has the answers i think what my gift is is the questions so what we do is in two monthly se group set sessions you work with me on those 12 ways to rock retail 
The re- we have a retail master portal. I can't even tell you all that's in it because we're still adding it out. But imagine this AI brain of mine that's going to actually be able to do role plays with you, that's actually going to be able to hold you accountable. You're going to be looking at a whole different routine for your life for the better, not like it's going to be something impossible, but you're going to find when you actually put the routine in place that suddenly you start seeing, you're not going to turn back to me and say, I don't know if this worked. You're going to know right away. And ultimately, it's going to have trackers, it's going to have resources, and it's going to hold you a lot more accountable than sometimes we hold ourselves, you know? And so how does it work? It's real simple. Next screen is going to be the payment information. When we built this, originally it was going to be $1,000 a month, $2,000 $2,000 onboarding. I said, this is the first time through. We just want to get enough people in the system that we can go through and effect change. So it's five forty nine dollars a month plus a one-time onboarding fee. I wish we could do real coaching and just take a percentage of the growth of the dip or the impact we made in people's businesses or lives, but we can't do that. So you have to come up with a number. But, but you know, when you think about this platform, so Coach Simple, the platform that Bob's talking about that is the coaching is it's it's not like you're going to get so much accountability and so much information that it's going to allow us to coach to the gaps. So we're going to be able to see what are you doing? What are your numbers? We're going to put in the key indicators that uh, will help us determine whether or not we need to make course corrections. And Bob's like going to be your Siri in the process. And so when you're off track or you're not heading in the right direction, he could say, make a U-turn. Let's go back and rephrase the way we're doing that. Or let's create the culture differently so that your people want to be here. And so you had to put a number to it. And I think 549 is kind of an issue. I don't have a coaching program that's that inexpensive. And so I think that um, being able to get access to the uh, brain, and you said that there's going to be an AI brain. Bob's taken all this content from 20 years of being in this industry. He's put it into his own AI engine. And you'll be able to search. and It'll answer in Bob Phipps. And you'll get real answers on how do we set up our meetings? What do we do for huddles? How do we role play scripts and dialogues? All of the things. Very cool. All of the things that you wish you could have access to are going to be in the brain, and it's uh, really cool to see it all coming together. And so this isn't this isn't uh, going to start until April, but we'd love to have a few of you uh, early adopters say, you know what I'm in, put me in, coach. People well, ask me, and I want you to think about it. The store is open 30 days a month on average. Do you think you could get twenty dollars a month extra from talking to me every day? I mean, excuse me, twenty dollars a day extra in a month? Do you think you could do that by talking to me? Because that's the question you got to ask yourself. Because ultimately, you're if you've been on the call this long, you knew this is where we were going. And more importantly, that moment where inside of you, you're like, yeah, I, I think I'm ready for this. Like, I've followed Bob for a long time. Maybe you're in sales or X, maybe you're not, doesn't matter. If you're in sales or X, it'll be better because you'll actually have other things. But the ability for us to take a 360 of your business is a little different than anything I've ever offered before. And I have a little bonus that the first five get an additional one-on-one or team meeting virtually with me anytime during the year. So that's a bonus. That's not a group call. That'll be like, maybe you're doing something in July, you're doing some kind of a kickoff. Maybe you're doing something uh, in a few months. Maybe it's going to be, you know, in April, it's going to be this week. doesn't matter. The goal is to make it so that you get value out of it. So that's it. And I'll present the uh, QR code in just a sec. Does anybody have any questions uh, while we're before I do that? Go ahead and fill the QR code up. Let's just chat for a minute because um, Let's you know, do it. we go through this conversation of who to coach and who not to coach. And um, I want you to think about the scenario of have you ever seen have you ever seen a little kid with like a Labrador puppy and that puppy is pulling the kid through the park and they, you can hardly hold on. You're like holding on to it with everything you can. You trying to hold that puppy. Well, we coach that puppy. If 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 you're the puppy on the leash that says, put me in, coach, I want to go. Um, if I have to put meat in front of your nose or if I have to motivate you or if I have to kick you, then like I, for me, I just don't have the energy to try and talk people into doing hard things. The difference between average and exceptional is the exceptional are willing to do the work that the average are not willing to do. And so if you want to be exceptional, um, you can just jump in and say, let's go. So if you do it, if you do it annually, you save a month. So it's uh, five forty nine a year, or a month. twelve times five fifty minus one month. So you save five hundred and fifty bucks if you want to do it annually. So you can do it either way. I would just say that just get into it. When I've uh, when I've taken people through coaching in a, in a singular group coaching program like this, um, you get to choose in the beginning who you got, who you're going to be in the program. Are you going to be a um, you want to talk about all your war stories? how you used to do things back in the day? 
Are you going to implement and do the activities your coach tells you to do some of the time, but not all the time? Or are you going to be a raving fan where you're just going to put in the effort? You're going to follow the coaching advice. You're going to do the work. And at the end, you're going to be the one that says, my my business doubled. I'm opening new stores. My people are happier. I've got more revenue to be able to change their lives. And my customers are writing more referrals. Like, who do you want to be? You want to be an also ran? You want to be a tweener? Or do you want to be a raving fan? So before you come in, would you mind just like making a decision of who you're going to be and which third you want to be in? Because if you self-identify as the lower one-third, I would rather have you not come through the program because you waste your money and it also sucks the valuable time of those who really want to make a difference. So let's just go for it. Um, I'm going to, I'll stop talking, Bob. I appreciate you letting me be part of this. I'm very passionate about coaching because I've seen the impact it has made on my life. And, you know, I've seen the impact it makes on the lives of those who we serve. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the opportunities and the growth. Cynthia, here's my high five. You're going to be a raving fan. Absolutely. At the end. She's I, the I figured it would, I, there's a couple others you, I'm like, I'm waiting to see you join. But the simple thing is, I think we get that choice where those moments in life are, are small in our lives. I think there are moments when I made a choice, when you made a choice, I can think about it. The day that I walked out of my job after 14 years and I said, I'm out. And I said, I have no idea what I'm doing. But I, that was five seconds of my life. I think we're in that moment for a lot of us, right? You've been successful. If you're on this call, you were successful. You've been doing a lot of things right. But suddenly, you got this opportunity. It's not like, let's be totally honest here. You're not going to be able to join this in like, oh, I'll join sometime in September, and then I'll, I'll come in and out. This is a year-long program. Every month, we're going to come up with a different topic. I'm not going to go through and give you a syllabus. It's not like that. you got to just trust me. And I think... You've it's been on this perfect. call long enough. You know to trust me. I know Verl has been in his business a long time. And yeah, you might have some questions. You can certainly send me an email, Bob at Retail Doc. But more importantly, if you know this is right for you, I'm going to put that back on just in case somebody is uh, forgotten. Uh, and you can just click that. It's pretty easy to do. And while I will go through and have a personal meeting you as we do your onboarding, just want you to start thinking about what is it that gets you going? What is it gets you to stop? And then ultimately, where did we leave that behind when we came to the store? And then you go from further than that and say, and where did I plug into some beliefs that probably don't really serve me well? Because what I'm going to give you is a new playbook. We're going to start at the top at those actions. You're going to take different, you're going to come up with different things to do, or maybe you've been doing it. We used to do it, or whatever. You're going to take a different routine. And then it's going to go through and you're going to say like, wow, that gave me a different uh, result. And those experiences build different beliefs. And from that, you realize, oh, my job is how do I develop my crew instead of complaining about things I can't complain about in a in an environment where it's funny. You know, people tell me, oh, it's so different now. And going back to you, Verl, uh, I remember this guy. I'm doing a keynote for a hot tub company and people are complaining about, oh, something's too much money and this and this and and I'm I'm having a back and forth. I'm like, ah, that's ridiculous. You know, there's always opportunity. And he stands up and he goes, I founded this company when people bought hot tubs on their credit cards at 24% interest. And you're telling me you can't do it. You need a billboard. He's like, get back to what you should be doing, which is knowing your customer. And more importantly, I would add the, I think what we've missed, we spent so much time talking about the customer experience we've lost the employees. And so when theft becomes big and we've said, you know, when I used to work in, uh, in cowboy business, I remember one of the owners said to me one time, you know, we have such high turnover. I don't even ask for the manager anymore. I just go, whoever's in charge for the day. <laughs> I was like, wow, that should have been my key. Like, yeah, you should be out of here. But I kept thinking like, oh, I'll make this work. Some of you might be saying, well, I can make this work, but maybe it's time to say, I need to change things up. And I would love for you to join us on Retail Mastery. You have to have PayPal. We, we did check both of them beforehand. So the left one is the monthly. The right one is the annual. Yeah, we'll send you all a thing on that. So I want to just, um, let's just kind of open, open it up. I'm going to give you an opportunity to write any questions you have in the chat box real quick. And you can ask us anything. This is like ask the coach. So uh, the doctor's in the house. There's a difference between um, how many of you have people that give you advice and you feel like they have no idea what they're talking about? Anybody, anybody have people in their life like that? 
they like they're constantly giving you ideas of what you should be doing in your business or why you should do this differently, but they don't walk in your shoes. <laughs> Rachel's like, oh yeah. So I think about um, I think about who Bob is in this picture, and it's not the person, your spouse, I, right? Um, you want to really have fun? Try having your spouse hold you accountable to something or the other way around. I, that's a cold, it's a long, cold winter look I get from my wife if I ever try and hold her accountable. Um, Bob's, Bob's the doctor. He's a retail doc for a reason. It's because he gives prescriptions based on analysis as opposed to just loose advice that um, here's a bunch of brainstorm ideas or things you might be able to try. And because it's based on experience, it makes it valuable. And what's hard is to get when you have somebody that's as busy as he is to get access to his brain and his counsel. A guy contacted me yesterday. He goes, I want to become like you. I was like, well, I started three years ago. Good luck with that. And he goes, what does it take? I said, you have to hit it out of the park, dude. Otherwise, you're just a guy telling me to do stuff. And that's why I chose you, because I wanted you uh, to go through. And Burl has helped me build this. And he's passionate about learning. And he's passionate about helping people get that change that they want. And that's why we're doing it. The goal is to get you involved in a worldwide community, not just the people right around you, right? Not selling necessarily the same thing, but it's the same struggle. Yeah. So some of the challenges that were put in the early thing in the in the uh, chat, let me just ask you a couple of those questions, Bob, and you can tell me how we're going to deal with that in, co in coaching. But um, Kelly said, one of my big challenges is follow through. It's like, it's holding my people accountable for the things are following through with uh, the commitments I made to them. How do you how do you address that? I don't think it hurts enough. If they don't hmm. do it, who cares? What does success look like? I've said this before. Uh, this is the generation that grew up on the Food Network. It's a quarter teaspoon of cilantro at three minutes and thirty seconds, and then you get this result. They're gamers. They learned how to hack the system. And now they take a transfer, a transporter back in time where you put them. You've, you've said they've got to be friendly. They've got to like people. If they have previous experience, great. You've taken all that. Like, lucky you, you found this unicorn. And now we put them into a store and we leave them alone, like one person coverage, or you put them with someone that doesn't give a crap about you or retail. And then we say, oh, it's hard to get people. Instead of just realizing that maybe I haven't valued enough what the stakes are. Because here's the thing, less people walk in the door, kids, what does that mean? Your conversion rate has to go up and your average check has to go up because yeah, you can try all kinds of ways to attract people. I mean, I had a woman tell me how great she liked to use um, the threads, either threads or Twitter, because she said, you know, when the bills come, I just say 30% off everything in the store and my crew comes right away. And I'm like, uh, that's not good. And she goes, oh, well, that's how I do it. It's like, you're trained your employee, you're trained your customers to wait till that 30% off sale because they know it's going to come. So when we get to all of that, I think we go through and we think accountability starts with them. But Verl, I think what you've it, illustrated it, with it us today, well, yeah, thank you, is it starts started. with me, right? Yeah, it, it totally does. But also you said some things like, you know, you work, you're, you have this gaming generation or this food network generation that, you know, they put a teaspoon, it's three minutes and they have a finished casserole. They have, they want instant gratification. So what are the systems and the processes you put in place to gamify their experience at work? So how are you creating or, or creating an environment that allows them to, work, to learn the way they prefer? Are you gamifying it? So that's what that's what the coaching platform does is it gamifies the things they track so that we can run contests and things like that. And Cynthia, that'll make a big impact with you, too, with your challenge on how do you make your managers more accountable? Um, there's a few verbalisms and you can write these down. I'm sure Bob's going to adopt them and make them his anyway. But one is that which gets measured gets done. If you don't measure it or track it, if it's not important enough to measure it it's almost impossible to hold someone accountable or do follow-up from the sales team. So we have to choose and decide what we're going to measure. And then we have to, we have to care about our people enough to ask them if they're tracking it because accountability is awareness. So that'd be the first thing is that which gets measured gets done. The second thing is, is we have to do daily huddles where we, where we talk daily about whether or not we hit our accomplishments from the day before or not, you know, it's a daily huddle. It's well, and both sides of that too, right? It's like, saying, hey, we did it, right? Or being able to oh, call out that one sale, 
Not that some guy walked in the door and said, I'd like $5,000 in, uh, in tea and spice a day. Well, great for them. It's the person that walked in and said, I don't know what I want. And they walked out with two shopping bags and then unpacking it and saying, wow, isn't that amazing? Instead of then finding a way it could have been better, it's just being able to say, that was great. And that could even be like you had most of your sales were 20 bucks and some kid had a $40 one. Just for that day, we are starved for attention. As much as uh, people think, oh, it's speakers, they just want applause. I, I tell you, all of you on this call want attention too. I want to feel I matter. It's that simple. People who feel they matter, buy more. But people who feel they matter work for you. When we don't, I think we have to look and say, well, what am I doing, right? And we're almost at time, my friend. Does it matter what industry you're in? If you're in the restaurant industry, does what you're going to teach apply? Absolutely. Great, great point. Because um, it's not it's not dependent on product, which I think is what gives it its strength. I don't care whether you sold toys or you sold appliances or you sold dresses or you sell consulting or you sell whatever it's going to be. In the end, if you've let these places go and you haven't been looking at them, you're going to find value at it. And more importantly, you're not going to... I've been in coaching. I'll just tell you, I did a coaching program. It was 40 grand one year. Unbelievable. And I was on the webinar. It was not nearly as exciting and fun as this with Burl. And I still bought it thinking, oh, this guy has a plan. You know what? He had no plan. We just got on the call. It was like, so what's going on, everybody? And you waited and you, you know, whatever it was, worthless. I might as well have dug a hole and said, none of this matters. I can guarantee you on that first call, you're going to go, wow, okay, I got some work to do. And more importantly, that's going to give you confidence. You're not going to wonder, right? Like, Cynthia, I need someone to give advice. And then you got to take it. That's the other part, right, Burl? It, it's, it's, it doesn't mean I know everything, but it does mean I'll ask you those questions that say, so is that working for you? Because if it isn't, then why are we still doing it? Yeah, I don't care what you do. Stop doing that. <laughs> We're going to do something different. Just as we wrap this up, um, Cynthia, Cynthia, I want you to just change. I want you to change the way you ask this question. I need to learn how to make my managers more accountable for the sales team. And so the, the way that the way I want you to think about the question is a coaching question: is how do I create an environment where my managers choose accountability over the people they lead? How do I create an environment where the managers choose to hold their people accountable? And that's the question is how do we create that? And that's what we're going to talk about in coaching is we're going to teach you how to do that. And it's going to be intentional and well thought out. We'll go step by step through that process to help them choose it. Because if they won't choose it, no matter how hard you try, just like me trying to make Joy do something she doesn't want to do. If I push her, Joy's going to push me back. But if I lead her and I teach her and she chooses to do it, then everybody wins in that process. And the relationship is much stronger as a result of me creating the environment where they choose it as opposed to trying to make them do it. Because we're getting on it because our goals experience yeah. is not action. Stuff. Bob, I have to go. Thank you so much for letting me be part of this. It's thanks, everybody. Fun. You know my address. You know everything. Verl, thanks for joining us. I hope you'll join me on the coaching program. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a year-long journey for all of us. And then you're not going to look around and say, what do I do? You're just going to say, I'm glad I was on that call with those two. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you again, Verl.